Uh, there's been a lot of talk lately about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, uh, how they could be potential treatments for COVID-19. But what are they? Why is Internet Drinky Man talking about them? Well, the reason why is actually they have a really funny relationship to, of all things, the gin and tonic. Uh, you see, back in the 1700s, a Scottish doctor by the name of George Cleghorn discovered that quinine could be used uh, for treatment and prophylaxis of malaria. It was a anti-malarial drug. Uh, as a result, British soldiers stationed in India were prescribed quinine as a regular regimen um, just to prevent the onset of malaria, back then in a powdered form. Quinine is really bitter, just like intensely, miserably bitter. Uh, so they would take their dose and mix it with a bit of soda water if they had it. And that made it a little bit more palatable, converted it into tonic water. That's what makes tonic water different than seltzer. It's got quinine in it. It was generally agreed upon that tonic water could be further improved with the addition of gin and lime, thus giving birth to the gin and tonic, possibly the only cocktail in history that was actually ever really a curative for anything, despite their, uh, you know, you know, like a Dr. Funk was, a, was prescribed as, uh, by Dr. Funk, actually, for Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, probably didn't do much for him. And maybe, maybe it would ward off scurvy, you know, same with grog, but this was a real medicine. But let's make a gin and tonic right now. Actually, let's make it two ways because I've got a lot more talking to do about the subject and I'm gonna feel a lot better about it when I've got a drink in my hand. So, um, first thing I wanna talk about is that a gin and tonic, it's not a highball. If you approach a gin and tonic like you would a highball, anything that's like a spirit mixer thing, you're going to have way too much tonic in there. Uh, it's going to be a really unpleasant drink. I really like Tomer's Tonic Syrup, uh, which it changes the way you build this drink. And I think it's not necessarily universal. Most people aren't going to be using this. If you have it, it's great. If you want to make your own, that's something we can talk about another time. You got to be very careful because the quinine can be dangerous. So this stuff is great. And he's got a ratio right on the bottle that I think is fantastic. Um, so, we're going to build this in the glass uh, over ice. I'm going to put a little cracked ice in my glass. Perfect. Uh, and we're going to go with one ounce of Tomer's Tonic Syrup. It's not very syrupy. It's, if you notice how it pours, it's not like a, it's, it's pretty mild as far as sweetness goes. It's very thin, um, but it does work. Uh, two ounces of London dry gin, or the spirit of your choice, but I think that there's uh, nothing wrong here with a bit of beef eater. That actually overshot <laughs> the pour and landed directly into this little cut I have on my knuckle, and boy does that hurt. And then three ounces of bubble water, three ounces of club soda or seltzer, whatever the local lingo is for you. I'm gonna measure this, uh, it's a, he suggests a three ounce pour. Um, first things first, let's stir this a bit to get our melt water and our gin and our tonic syrup combined. And then we'll put in our three ounces of seltzer. Although honestly, I think free pouring here is more than fine. Give it just a little agitation to get everything kind of combined. And, um, I don't know about you, but I love, I need a lime twist or just a wedge in, in my gin and tonics. And there we have a gin and tonic made with Tomer's tonic syrup. My God, that is good. It has a, the tonic syrup, man, I love it. It has a much more, a lot more character. You know, and honestly, I don't mind even a little twist of lime in there too. A little twist of lime with the actual lime juice. Uh, and that's how I make it with the Tomers. You may or may not have Tomers. If you just have regular tonic, uh-oh, where to put my bottle of tonic? It's around here somewhere, there it is. Um, first off, I would say don't skimp on the tonic. Get the best tonic you can. This is a huge component of the drink and there's an enormous range in quality of tonics. As a matter of fact, that might be some live stream content. We should do tonic tasting. Uh, Q tonic, everybody loves it. This is, uh, Q tonic is widely regarded as the best uh, bottled tonic water. Um, and, and maybe you want this anyway. Maybe you don't like that this is now got this very natural, earthy color. I love that. It doesn't bother me at all. If you want it to be clear and bright the way you expect a gin and tonic to be, you're going to need to use something a little bit more refined like this. Um, the way I make a gin and tonic, 
and I don't know anybody who doesn't do it this way. I can't, I don't measure them so much. I mean, maybe I'll measure my spirit, but I'm gonna take my glass, put my cracked ice in it. Just ice going everywhere here. Um, I'm gonna add two ounces of this London Dry Gin. You could do, you know, a measured pour of lime juice, but I'm just gonna put in a squeeze of lime juice. There's really no reason to be super uh, pretentious about this. I like mine to be pretty limey, so that's about a quarter of a lime that I just hand squeezed in there. I'm gonna give that a gentle mix. And then I'm just gonna free pour my tonic in. That's about, right there, that's about two parts gin to one part tonic. I can tell from where we're pouring. Let's see how that is. I think we go a little more with the tonic. I think we can go right to the top. So it's about equal parts. Never a bad idea to garnish, right? And a gin and tonic. That's lovely. Very approachable, very refreshing. A lot less funky than the Tomers. Uh, a little less dimension. I don't know how to explain it. Let me explain. This is lime, citrus, and bitter, and ginger. And definitely very refreshing on a hot day. It's only spring now, and we're trapped indoors. So I don't know if you're gonna have a huge amount of time for these right now, but super awesome drink when it's like 110 degrees out. Nothing better, man, except for maybe like a Queen's Park Swizzles right there. Um, but to do a back-to-back -back real quick. Yeah, this one's got like an earthy, rooty, um, a funkiness to it. Just a funkiness to it. Kind of not unlike a, a rum funk. I love this. I think they're both great. This is just a little clean for my tastes, to be honest. Um, I'll take the weird one. Now that I've got a drink in my hand, let's talk about chloroquine hydroxychloroquine uh, for just a few minutes, if you will bear with me. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are derivatives of quinine. They are principally designated as anti-malarial medications, not antiviral medications. Uh, and they also see a lot of use in treating certain kinds of arthritis and autoimmune disorders like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so let's break that back down a bit. Malaria is caused by a parasite, not a bacteria or a virus, it's a little bug. Um, so it really bears no resemblance to a virus, except that it's in you and you don't want it in you. I mentioned that it does get a lot of use in treating inflammation, uh, like the inflammation that's caused by lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or other autoimmune disorders. And that's because chloroquine is an immunosuppressant and inflammation is an immune response. It's, um, so if you can diminish somebody's immune response, you will reduce their inflammation. You will reduce their arthritis and the effects of their lupus. So now you might be asking yourself, why are we looking at an immunosuppressant to treat a deadly infectious disease? It seems counterintuitive. Well, uh, a few weeks back, I was struck with a really nasty case of mysterious viral bronchitis. Uh, this is a little bit before they were testing for COVID-19 here in the U.S., but I did test negative for flu. Um, so I can't say that I didn't have it. I was really sick, like extremely sick. They thought I had pneumonia, did an x-ray on my lungs, found out that I didn't have pneumonia, but I did have severe inflammation. And they put me on prednisone. Now I had taken prednisone a bunch of times because I get a really nasty response to poison ivy. So when I get exposed now, I just, I just go to the doctor, I get the drugs to make it much more, make my life more bearable. I know that prednisone is an immunosuppressant. So I asked the doctor, so uh, what's up with that? Why are you putting me on an immunosuppressant? And they thought that was a good question that they don't get that often. I said, you know, it's also an anti-inflammatory and your lungs are inflamed. And the current thinking based on a lot of research on this is that if you have inflamed lungs and your oxygen level in your blood is reduced as a result, it's better to get that inflammation down, to get your oxygen level up than it is to preserve the sanctity of your white blood cell count or your immune response in general. And I said, oh, okay, yeah. They say, you know, with flu and stuff like that, we see actually a faster recovery time. And that makes a lot of sense then, actually, if 
The issue with COVID-19 is inflammation of the lungs, preventing people from being able to breathe. Reducing that inflammation would go a long way in treating the condition, right? Um, it doesn't remove the virus from your body, only your immune system or antiviral drugs are going to do that. But it will make it so that you won't suffocate, which is the thing that the virus does to kill you. It's not like it liquefies your insides. This isn't the Motabu virus from, from outbreak. It's a, it's a real virus. So we're just gonna take a minute here to put on our media criticism hat and talk a little bit about the coverage around chloroquine and what I take objection to. I'm shooting this episode on April 5th, 2020. And up until a few days ago, there was exactly one study done on the use of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in treating COVID-19 patients. It was conducted at the Institut Hospitalo Universitaire, or IHU, in France, Marseille, France, on a very small sample of patients, none of whom had terribly advanced COVID-19, and most importantly, without a control group. That alone should tell you that this study is garbage and that anything that is using this study as a basis for anything is lying or is also garbage, nonsense. And I'd love to tell you that the information I have about the study gets better, but it actually gets worse. The head guy at the IHU is a Dr. Didier Reut, okay? And while the IHU has a name that sounds like some storied institution of health and sciences that has been a part of the French government for years and years, it's actually his own personal lab that he started 10 years ago with support from, you know, totally not corrupt president Nicolas Sarkozy. Didier Raoult is something of a divisive figure in the medical and science community, it seems, because he is so very interested in being so cozy with so many politicians. Since being at the IHU, Didier Raoult has co-signed something over 3,000 papers, um, published medical papers. I don't work in the field of medicine or science, but I've read around about this. And apparently, that is a ludicrous number. That is a giant red flag number. Uh, the medical and scientific community has apparently raised red flags for years about this guy and his practices. Uh, that he's basically just signing his name to work he has nothing to do with, not overseeing, not double-checking, uh, run basically in a paper mill, which is what the IHU seems to be. So to reiterate, one study, very small sample size, broadly not so credible doctor guy, uh, in his private paper mill um, with no control group. And I gotta just explain for people who don't know what that means. That means when you do a study like this, right, you take your participants, you secretly break them into two groups and you secretly give half of them a placebo and then the other half get your potential treatment and you compare the differences in outcome. He had no control group. He just took a group of people, I think it was 20, and just gave them chloroquine and said, they got better. <laughs> it's not like they got better instantly. They got better the way that people get better. <laughs> Now, this is where the media criticism part of this comes in, because I've read a lot of articles in like major publications, New York Times, Washington Post, that will refer to all of what I just said to you as one French study says, or one French study found, or a French study found, without ever mentioning that there is only one study. And it is this crazy bad French study. It's a weasel words. It's the equivalent of saying, people are saying, or you know, I hear all the time, uh, and all the initial hype around chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine was based on this guy's study. Dr. Fauci, being careful not to run too far afoul of his boss, uh, and using the terms of a clinician, says there is only anecdotal evidence. We've got plenty of hearsay and conjecture. Those are kinds of evidence. Which to lay people sounds like, oh, there's some evidence, but they've got to cross the uh, T's and dot the I's before they can really sign off on this thing. But to science people, sounds like, this is currently the equivalent of the power of prayer or homeopathy. This is, there's no evidence for this. Those same articles that will say, oh, a French study found, also say Bayer is making available hundreds of thousands of doses. And it sounds like when you read that, Bayer is making available. <laughs> uh, that what is happening is that like, oh man, they're really invested, this is for real. Like, they're going off book. They're gonna, they're going wild card. They're gonna treat people. We've gotta get this to the masses and Bayer is stepping in to fill the void. No, 
That's not what that says. Bayer is making available the free market for money because of a hype man somewhere has decided to buy tons of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine because everybody's clamoring for it. And Bayer is happy to sell it to them. has nothing to do with it being effective. A drug company, when you go to buy it from Bayer, they're not gonna say, you know this doesn't work for them. They're just gonna say, sure, yeah, you can buy whatever you want. Money, please. We're in business to make money. Uh, now I've gotta say, I've rewritten this a couple of times because things have changed. As of today, April 5th, 2020, there are two additional studies. One out of uh, a lab in Wuhan, uh, this is in preprints currently, so it has not yet gone through peer review, but it shows some improvement in non-critical patients with the treatment of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. But another study out of France, um, and the information on where that study is from is going to be up on screen because I don't know it off the top of my head, says, no, there was no improvement in our study. So here's my closing point. Whatever anyone online or in the media or standing at a podium tells you, do not Please, I beg you, under any circumstances, go out and attempt to self-administer anything you haven't been prescribed by a doctor. Uh, when this whole thing kicked off, husband and wife uh, found some chloroquine phosphate in their fish tank, self-administered it, thinking that they would prevent themselves from getting COVID-19 by doing so, and the husband died. The wife spent many days in intensive care uh, and is now a widow. There are people online uh, who are claiming things that like Chloroquine, quinine, tonic. Ah, you should drink diet tonic and take some zinc tablets. That'll do it for you. You'll be fine. Uh, that is not true. Anybody who is telling you that is lying. Wait for the science. And please follow your licensed medical professional's instructions. Really. I think that's the whole story. I think that's it. Although I will enjoy this quinine thoroughly. This is great quinine. Today we talked about the gin and tonic, its history as an actual medicine, uh, and hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. A little bit outside of the norm. I don't normally do media criticism here on how to drink. Maybe something I'd like to do more of. Uh, but, you know, strange days call for strange things. I don't know what to say. I hope you are all uh, safe and sound at home, uh, socially isolating and healthy and sound. I'm sure we will get through this in one way or another. And until then, since I'm doing things way outside of my wheelhouse to begin with, I may as well borrow from Edward R. Murrow and say good night and good luck.